Hello, and welcome to my look at the original Nightmare on Elm Street. From the opening moments of a dank boiler room in the flickering New Line Cinema, Vanity Plate, this is easily one of my favorite horror films ever. For the perspective of an 11 year old 25 year old, I just love this film. It's quite a short of a haunting score by Charles Bernstein, it's a very first film of a young Johnny Depp. It was totally unknown at the time, and one way or another, everyone knows him now. Wes Craven, who wrote and directed this film, ended up changing horror forever the tale of Freddy Krueger. With his pen, he has seen 2013, this will be many parts of his legacy and will remain a classic. He also apparently based a character played by Robert Englund on an actual brotherly named by playing Fred Krug. This also applies to the villain of his previous film, The Last House on the Left, named Krug as well. Fan that shows how if someone is bullied, they one day moralize them in film. There's also a relatively amusing gag of Depp's character trying to prank his way on the tape of sound effects, but falls apart when he has the tape of race car accidents and those airport sounds. I have to love how massive that stereo is replaced a tape on it. Way back while his phones and PA players so you carry down your songs in your pocket, there was that. As it turns out Depp's character whose name is Glenn by the way ends up being consumed in this dream spat out in a warp in front of blood. Although I still love the atmosphere the film has, going both elements of psychological and supernatural horror, I have immense appreciation for her practical special effects in this film even after more than 30 years. Some of them may be part of their time, but they had the unsettling and mind-made nature of the film. Hmm. The first victim is Tina Gray, played by Amanda Weiss, who ends up with a chest slashed open above her bed. The police are horrified by this, but it's even more surprising that Kruger has his place burned down by the pains that children he killed years ago. The film also acknowledges they'll have a line between dreams and realities of both in this scenario, which is definitely illustrated by the iconic bathtub scene, where, before the scene mentioned earlier one's death, Freddy almost drowns our lead Nancy, played by Heather Langenkamp. There's also the death of Rob, by Nick Quarry, and Lieutenant Don Thompson, played by John Saxon, knows the similarities to see one movies years ago. So, Nancy also dreams Alan's at the hospital, and we'll get to one in the examiners, Dr. Keynes, played by Charles Fleischer, who later played Roger Rabbit. We'll get to that one soon, could use some levity based on what's happened lately. As Glenn is killed, I just had to love the old turntable on huge CRT getting sucked in with him. Admittedly, one had the same impact as just watching videos online and listening to music on an iPhone. Same reason not doing the 2010 remake either. That, and I didn't really care for it. Now, the time's coming for films to no Mons, where Nancy wants to bring Freddy into the real world, where his powers will be useless. Even though her mother, Marjorie, reluctant, and she knows what her daughter has to do. The competition at her house is easily one of my most mind bending horror film battles I've ever seen. As Nancy sets fire to Eddie, to Freddy, <laughs> it's more satisfying than a lousy NES game. He always jumped away before I got the final blow and never been knew I had to find him and burn his remains. The guys who own the game didn't have the manual, the game didn't tell me. Barely last now before I went back to Supermarket for this duck hunt for the umpteenth time. Even as Freddy but fails to return with a scorched body, Nancy is able to hold him off till sunrise, where his powers are rendered useless. I always like that idea and symbolism behind it. Also, the final shot uh, of Marge being turned to a dummy straight through the kids may be immediately a little dodgy, but in my eyes, it's at your creepiness and the mind made nature of the film. This film has been one of my Halloween traditions for 14 years, and I'm glad to have shared it with you all. While Wes Craven may be gone, what he left behind will last forever. While the sequels, including Craven's own new nightmare, may be wild in quality, overall I can find strength to enjoy all of them. Even the 2010 remake, even if it failed on its own, I can definitely say it makes a good spoof in the right circumstances. On that note, this film has also been parodied on Simpsons Trials of Horror, Grim Adventure Billy and Mandy, and Rick and Morty, among countless others. Still, this movie proves a great experience of more than 30 years. It also made $25 million on my special $1.8 million, made one of the most successful horror films. And that time is one of the many ones in 1984. That was a good year for horror, fantasy, and science fiction. This won't be the only horror film I'll cover either. If I had to bump some stuff in November, I would be eager to share with you all. Right now, I'm just going to enjoy this movie. If I rating four out of four, I have plenty of other content planned for Halloween this year, so don't go anywhere and don't fall asleep. If you do, I will know. Bang. <laughs>